That's great. That's great. Marriage, what a challenge, huh? The other difficult thing that we do as men is to be fathers, and that's the series that we're in, Dads That Make a Difference. I'm glad you're here at Forge, and uh, as we have gathered together, Forge, I just want to remind you, it's a place for men at all stages of a spiritual journey. We uh, desire to become great men as God defines greatness. And our culture uh, is, does not build great men uh, anymore. But Jesus Christ has always built great men. And so that's what we're about. And I'm glad you're here. And I appreciate your prayer for uh, all that went on at Las Vegas. And uh, uh, boy, I got to say a couple of things about that because it fits what we're talking about today in this, in this series. You know, our president said some good words about to the people, to the families, uh, about uh, what went on there. And he said it was an act of pure evil, and, and, it, and it was. There will be many other people that will say it was an act of insanity, and, and it was. Uh, the reality is, is that evil and insanity often are intertwined. Uh, and that you can look at this psychologically or you can look at it morally, but the reality is they are definitely, definitely connected. And uh, one thing that we as Christian men have to always understand is that evil always has the initial uh, advantage because it is willing to do the unthinkable to the unsuspecting. And it's important for us to understand that evil has the initial advantage, but in the long run, it is dealt with and it has been dealt with. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, as people say, why doesn't God do anything about this? Well, he has and he will. Uh, the cross is empty and so is the tomb and Jesus Christ is coming again. And so in the meantime, we have to continue to promote his kingdom that will never fail. And, and be the king, follow the king. And as men, uh, you know, Las Vegas points out to us again how important men are. Because we are so often the problem makers in our culture. Uh, and, and, and we need to continue to build great men as God defines greatness. That's why we meet. Uh, and so you all are incredibly important and incredibly influential in the lives of other men. So I'm glad you're here and in this subject that we're talking about today and dads that make a difference, uh, I, I, you've got outlines with you there on your table. And it's important that, that we understand that last week we talked about uh, the importance of fathers in our lives and how our fathers shape us as fathers, right? And until we process our own father wounds and the, the imprint of the father in our life, if we have negative earthly father, till we process those things, we won't be able to move deeply into fathering, grandfathering, and mentoring other men. We have to process our earthly father experience. So if you weren't here last week, and some of you weren't, Stan wasn't here. Stan, I didn't want to throw you into the bus. You weren't here. I don't know where you were. Uh, you'd been more spiritual had you been here. But, um, uh, but Stan was one, he said, I want you to teach that again here today. I can't do that today because we got to move on. But um, um, we speak the male love language of shame and abuse here where you, you get thrown under the bus a little bit once in a while. But uh, you can go back and watch that video because it, uh, of last week's here because it is determinative for where we're going. There, in the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about three things. We're going to be talking about how a father develops his kids with three key areas. Protection, identity, and confidence. And so that's why the Las Vegas thing, uh, as vulnerable as all of those people were, they were in a killing zone. They were vulnerable. They didn't have the protection. And as we talk about fathering today and talk about protection, we're going to be talking about something that dads uniquely bring to the equation. I, I said it before, I love being a dad. Uh, I love being a granddad. I, I love being able to mentor other men and being involved in that process. Uh, being a father, uh, boy, I tell you, uh, it's never a dull moment, right? Uh, you never have the energy that you thought you would have that you had before you had kids. And you're always exhausted. And uh, I know women, the mothers struggle with that a little bit too. But that's, uh, we come home and we can't punch the clock. But kids are amazing. I love this uh, top 10 lessons from children that uh, uh, I learned several years ago. 
Somebody said it to me. Top 10 lessons from children. When you hear the toilet flush and the words, "Uh uh-oh, it's already too late. Uh, A king-size waterbed holds enough water to fill a 2,000 square foot house four inch deep. That gentleman learned that the hard way. Another lesson, the number three, is brake fluid mixed with Clorox makes smoke (laughs) and lots of it. (laughs) Number four, always look in the oven before you turn it on. Uh, Number five, if you hook a dog's leash over a ceiling fan, the motor is not strong enough to rotate a 42-pound boy wearing a pound puppy underwear and a Superman cape. I like that one. Number six is... It is strong enough, however, to spread paint on all four walls of a 20 by 20 foot room. Um, Number seven, I can't, I can't say. Number eight, the spin cycle on the washing machine does not make earthworms dizzy. (laughs) Number nine, it will, however, make cats dizzy. And number 10, Legos will pass through the digestive tract of your (laughs) four-year-old. There's a lot of lessons. Fatherhood's meant to be a part of the adventure. Now, if you have your Bibles, let me read to you Psalm 78 because that provides a basis for us talking about fathering. Remember last week we talked about Deuteronomy 6, another key passage in fathering. And I want want to say a couple of things here before I read Psalm 78 while you're turning. And that is some of you are are not fathers uh, of young children anymore, and that's okay. Some of you are grandfathers, and we need you in the game. Some of you are not married, don't have any kids yet. Some of you look at the fathering process and you say, I don't have any influence in my kids. They're not here. They're not around. I'm divorced. I'm separated from them. I don't have an influence. Guys, this is all really, really important stuff for all of us as men. And we need grace because every one of us has failed as a father to some extent. This is not a lesson for perfect men. And this is not a lesson for those of us to be overwhelmed with guilt. Okay? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus has taken our guilt. So learn what God puts uh, uh, before you today and share it with somebody else. But understand, he loves you because of Jesus, not because you did everything perfectly right. Because I haven't, and that's for sure. Psalm 78. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to Him. Isn't that a powerful text, guys? That is our task, to be generationally involved. That's why I love that we have multiple generations here. Young men, older men, and even older men, like myself. We need this multi-generational movement of men mentoring men and understanding. Now, what I want to do real quick, is I want us uh, as we, um, and by the way, I forgot to promote Forge Communicators, but it fits. I, I think it's great that we have this opportunity to be together and to talk about things, all things men here at Forge. We have another site, but what we want to do in the long run is train young communicators to speak to other men. And that's what Forge Communicators is about. We had 20 in our first class with five uh, uh, evaluators, 25 people in our first class. And we're going to have another class uh, in October. uh, And I'll, I'll be sending out information about it. Look for that because we need men who will mentor men. Because as men flourish, then women, children, churches, and culture do. Because our task, Psalm 78 says, is to pass it on. 
Now, I want to give a quick video from Dr. Rod Cooper. He's a friend of mine, a uh, seminary professor, and he's going to talk about open and closed systems. I think it's rolling. When I work with families, I've found that there are basically two kinds of family systems. There's, there's what we call a, a closed family system. And what we mean by that is that the family basically operates strictly on performance. You're either in or you're out based upon how you perform. So people are always on edge. There's a sense of always needing to keep the rules. You really can't be yourself. In fact, appearance is more important than substance. It's more important than what it looks like as opposed to really what it is. And so these kinds of families encourage kids to keep secrets. They encourage kids to perform and, and not be completely honest. Uh, it kills communication because kids don't want to talk because the more they share, the more trouble they might get into. And so basically, it really shuts people down and conforms them to a role rather than allowing them to be who they are. But when we look at a system that's called an open system, and we don't mean anything goes in an open system. There are boundaries. There are certain rules that are kept. But within those rules or guidelines, there's a lot of freedom that these folks live by principles. They allow kids to take risks, to, to be themselves, that there's a sense of safety there where you can talk about anything and know that it's not gonna come back and get you later. Uh, people don't play roles in this particular uh, system. Uh, people do what they need to do at that particular time. So if, if mom is, let's say, working and she can't do certain things, dad will jump in and do certain things like clean the house or whatever because basically he's not tied into a role as he is into meeting the needs of the family. So it's, it's a very different frame. In fact, you know whether your home is an open home or a closed home by if your kids want to bring their friends there. If kids want to bring their friends to your house, then basically it's a pretty open system because they feel safe not only for them to be there, but for their buddies to be there as well. All right, gentlemen, this is a key element, a key uh, uh, tool for us as fathers, grandfathers, and influencers to understand. The, the difference in a home life between an open and a closed system. And what I want to do is I want to explain that a little bit more. And then I want you to have some table talk up front. And then I'll come back and wrap it up. So we'll do our table talk a little bit earlier uh, today as you interact with the open and closed system. How many immediately sort of got the general idea? It was a short clip. Open and closed system. And, and, you, and you, if you, if you kind of got the idea right away, you kind of, it was kind of an aha about your family environment that you were raised in. I, clearly, I was raised in a closed system family. And, and we have, uh, if you flip over to the other side of your outline there, I think we have some of these, uh, the, the elements of it. Um, what I want to do is I want to explain those to us uh, briefly. Um, yes, I've got the same thing on my outline as I've got it in my notes here. That's always a good thing. In a closed system, it's about conformity, isn't it? It's about there being such a heavy-handed sense of control in the family that everybody's got to conform and everybody's got to be the same. In an open system family, there's an understanding that, that we don't want to just get conformity. We want to get transformation. In other words, do you remember what we said was the definition of, of parenting or of fathering? Uh, last week, some of you, some of you remember, discipling our kids to love God and other people. It's building a life. That's what it is. Well, you see, in a closed system, the reality is, is uh, dad is all that, uh, and a mom aren't, aren't all that interested in that. They just want conformity. <laughs> Do it my way. Have you ever said that to your kids or heard that? Uh, don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, but in an open system family, there's, a, uh, there's an understanding that children are all different. And we'll come back to that. And so we want to help transform them. We want to build their lives. We want to disciple them, understanding that each child is different. In a closed system, there is fear. Uh, in other words, you're walking around the home, and uh, you know, a lot of times, dad, daddy is not daddy. He's father. Watch out, because you never know what's going to happen. 
Uh, but in an open system home, as, as Rod Cooper talked about, there's, there is safety. There's a sense that I'm okay. It's a safe place to be. In a closed system home, it's about control. Again, making it happen, doing it my way. But in an open system home, there's freedom within boundaries. Do you catch that? Did you hear what he said? It's not like in an open system home where not, we're, not, we're saying, it's, hey, it's, it's a free-for-all. Do whatever you want. I think we struggle with this in America today. I think some homes are really still very closed, but I think we've also, all, because we've overthrown the Judeo-Christian ethic, we've almost gone farther the other way where parents aren't really developing their kids much at all. They're, they're letting this idea of values clarification, you figure it out. And they're letting their, I, I found, even as a pastor, seeing a lot of parents stop parenting their kids in middle school. Just letting them do their own thing. I don't have the right to tell them what to do. I said, are you crazy? And I think I said that a few times in counseling. Are you crazy? Of course you have the right. Uh, and, and so uh, freedom within boundaries. But boundaries are important. Uh, in training uh, kids. In a closed system, it's all about performance, man. It's not who you are. It's that you're toeing the line. In an open system home, it's more about future development and developing those kids. They are going to be different. Your kids are going to be different than you. They're not going to do everything you want them to do. And that's a good thing. We already have one of you. We have two of you. They're redundant. You're redundant. Um, the playing of a role and wearing a mask Every man understands this if he was raised in a closed system home. I got to play a game. Because I don't play a game and I step out of line, I'm going to get hurt. And it just doesn't work. Uh, but in an open system home, there is authenticity. Because there's an ability to be who you are within boundaries, right? Um, there's an emphasis on punishment versus uh, in an open system, it's redemption. There's surface interaction versus true communication in a closed system home. You know, you get as far as, hey, how are you doing? Good. How did your how did classes go today? Good. How did your report go? Good. That's all I want to hear. Did you get an A? Why not? It's, 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 it's surface stuff. But in, in a closed system home, you can push deeper to how they feel, to what they're really experiencing. And men, we could do that, by the way. It's not just for the ladies. We have to be able to do that. Um, it's all surface in a, in a closed system, but there's trust in an open system. Uh, in a closed system, uh, pronouncements from on high, you will do this. In a closed system, there's more the interaction. You can question. You can think. Um, uh, and, and so th there's a big difference in how you raise your kids will we'll tend to flow from how you were raised unless you think about it and make a break and make a break. And the gospel enables us to do this differently. And what I want you to do around the table for the next 20 minutes, and then I, well, about 15 minutes actually, is to talk about these things. There's some questions. Uh, that I, this open and closed system, uh, the, the question I, I want to, to you to talk about is, as far as you understand it right now, what kind of a home were you raised in, a closed or an open system? And how did that affect you? Talk about that around your table for a few minutes to flesh out how it affected you. And then I'm going to come back together and sort of give you three basic principles of how protection uh, works in an, in an open system environment uh, and will help us grow as fathers, grandfathers, and men mentoring men as well. All right? About 15 minutes. Talk about that around your table. Were you in a closed system home or an open system home and how did that influence you. Go for it. Uh, we interrupted some good talk around the table. But I, but I don't mind interrupting with this. Dave, Dave thinks I'm obsessed with the hammer. I think it's a good model for parenting. A taser works as well. 
<laughs> hey, talk to me real quick. Let's do some talking before I, I give you some teaching and then get you out of here on time. Tell, tell me, what, what stages do kids need, uh, need protection from their dads and moms? But protection, what stages? Protect, what, do they need, to, okay, what kind of protection do they need when they're infants? Lots of protection. What, what about toddlers? Do they need protection then? Lots of protection because they're learning to walk and they're toddling and they're falling. What else do they need protection? Adolescence? They, they need protection in middle school? They need protection in high school? <laughs> when do they not need protection? When they're off the family payroll, right? <laughs> but not necessarily. Because once a parent, always a parent, right? There's a sense in which that is true. And uh, as a man, we continue to be in some roles. It looks differently, doesn't it? Uh, but we can stay in, in, involved. Here's the point as we think about open system. An open system gives your child a place to become everything God wants them to be. An open system is a better environment than a closed system to develop a child, to build a life, to disciple a child. So uh, there's uh, certainly advantages. Can, can you grow up and become a healthy whole man if you were raised in a closed system? Yes, you can, as long as you get the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the, G the gospel can undo any bad system and make us into men that God wants us to be and help our family. So the gospel is determinative. By the way, I want to say this, that I believe that fathering uh, is, is not just a science, it's an art. You, you read these books on fathering, you know, and, and it's like if you just do this, your kids will turn out great. I, Mary, they say the same thing about marriage. Marriage books are the same way. You do these things and you're, you'll have this wonderful, perfect marriage. I remember teaching a seminar up in Michigan, never forget it. And it was all on marriage. And the guy came walking out afterwards. He shook my hand. He said, Pete, I've done everything you suggested. And my wife wants more. Okay, we live in a broken world. So, you know, parenting and developing a marriage has an artistic dimension to it as well as a science. You can't just apply principles and it'll happen. God has to be involved. Uh, there has to be the power of God involved. And sometimes it just doesn't work out the way you want it to. Right? All right. So it's important for us to understand this. Now, let me, let's talk about three major areas where we can provide protection for our kids. I want to pull this together quickly. And, and uh, you can think about this stuff as, as we head out um, in the week. First of all, an open system provides a feeling of belonging. A feeling of belonging. When you provide an open system in parenting, it provides a system, uh, a sense of home. Uh, and, and this is what we are, guys, one thing I, I had to learn because I, I didn't have a model of this is I had to learn that I was responsible for what went on in the home, not my wife. I mean, I had this idea from what was modeled to me that the dad took care of the work and the mom took care of the home. I had to learn and relearn from the Bible that I was responsible too for the home. That it wasn't my wife's responsibility to set the emotional tone in the home. It was my responsibility because I was the leader of the home. And I'll bet, don't raise your hand, but I'll bet a bunch of us didn't know that and that we had this sense of division of labor so that when we come home, you know, hey, we're going into her world, not our world. No, it's our world. It's our world, too, because we're responsible as the spiritual leaders, and we get to. See, to me, pa parenting, fathering was, I get to do this. What a cool thing. I get to break a cycle. And uh, so we want to help create. Now, do we learn a lot about creating a sense of belonging? Can we learn a lot from our wives in this area? Absolutely. Do, do wives sometimes have a better understanding of relational connectivity I've just said relational connectivity. None of us knows what that means, actually. <laughs> no, we do, we do. But a lot of times our wives understand some of that better. But sometimes the man understands that better. And don't downplay that. Because some of you have incredible gifts of creating belonging in the home. A sense of home. Memories. Uh, creating memories and traditions um, that... Uh, 
that we understand that, that there's a sense of belonging because you understand that every kid is different. I love Psalm, uh, Proverbs 22, 6. You've, this is a familiar one. Train up a child according to his way, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. I, that phrase in the Hebrew, according to his way, can be translated differently. It can be translated, train up a child according to the way. But the Hebrew does allow for train up a child according to his way, which shows that there are temperamental differences in every kid. Every kid is different. You know that's true. And, and I've, I've been very clear about this. Is it's a joy to have my firstborn son here who, in whom I'm well pleased. But I had to discipline him regularly. He was born telling me what to do. My second born son may have been more passive aggressive, but he, he learned from his older brother. But temperamentally, he was a little bit different. And then Jesse, the warrior princess, came along a little bit later. And she got away with a whole lot. I know, I know, she did. But, but, but each kid is different. I mean, what motivates you? I, I raised my voice a little bit with Jessie. She's in line. With Joel, it was like, well, he raised his voice. It's great. It's a contest. And um, so every child is different. Viva la différence, right? I, in many respects, because of having a strong-willed child is great because you can say, listen, I don't have to ever worry when he gets out on his own. It's going to be all right. And when you get older, you can do it your way. But now you got to do it my way um, for the time being. Help them feel special. Know that you value them. Give them warmth. Uh, you have to give words of affirmation to your kids, and you have to say it. You can't suspect that they will know it. I know numbers of men say, I think my dad loved me. I'm pretty sure he loved me, even though I never said it. No, you got to say it, right? That creates a sense of belonging. Give them a sense of heritage, of your family, of your roots, where you were raised, uh, traditions. Do some of that. Some of you have done that way better than I'll ever have done that. But build, build into those traditions in your family. Talk to your wife. Work those things out. Create a family crest. Create a family video. Do ministry projects together. I guess the question is, how can you bring a feeling of belonging and safety to your kids? That's, that's our job. We, we need to think creatively, practically, about how we can do this. Secondly, we create a protection not only by providing a sense of belonging, but by giving appropriate boundaries. Uh, there's no freedom without fences, right? I mean, you, you, I, I'm one that, that does believe that fences make good neighbors. Not only in my neighborhood, uh, but, um, but nationally. Fences work in a lot of respects. There are more fences and walls in the world today than there ever have been. And they do, they have provided a great deal of protection. Ephesians 6.4 says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is telling us that we need to teach our kids and provide boundaries, but not to frustrate them and exasperate them. There's a balance, isn't it? How much law is enough law? Wow, that's the artistic part of this thing. And um, do we get, by the way, do we get, the applica do we get them to conform right away? Are you kidding me? It depends on how, what their temperament is. Some will, some won't. Um, but we have to give them appropriate boundaries. A river without boundaries, we know this, is damaging to everybody. You want to you you uh, bring child abuse into the life of your kid? Don't give him any boundaries. He'll become a serial killer years to come or completely a sensualist, he or she. There are negative boundaries, there are rules, and natural consequences. And uh, we live in a very permissive age where you're almost a child abuser if you put any boundaries. Don't listen to the world in this. We've got to give boundaries. We've got to let our kids face the consequences. Uh, we've got to let them experience things through pain. Uh, an open system values these lessons as much as others. Rules are appropriate, nothing... And unless there's force, what gets a kid's attention? Why spank a kid? Boy, this is controversial. 
James Dobson helped me with this a long time ago. I had to come to terms with this right away. Right away. It is action that gets kids' attention. It's not words. You know, Proverbs says, Proverbs says, um, you, know, you know, if you beat your kid with a, I love that word, <laughs> if you beat your kid with a rod, he's not going to die. Now, again, beating, I don't, I don't, that's not a fortunate translation, I think. I never beat my kids. I swatted them on the rear. That's where God made them to be swatted. with the appropriate instruments. <laughs> I got to stop, but my mind wants to go in a lot of different directions here. But the reality is it's action that, and a little bit of pain that gets their attention. No pain, no gain in working out. It's true with kids. If, there's no, if, there's no, if they made a bad decision as they get older and they have no financial pain from the bad decision they made, how are they going to learn? Uh, and so the reality is there's negative boundaries, but there's also positive boundaries where we are giving goals and guidelines, or dreams for our kids. You know, Alwinsons do this. Alwinsons don't do this. You, you, set a, you get to set the tone of your family. Isn't that a great thing? And it's hard if your wife is not in step with you on those things, right? That adds a layer of complexity in this. But that's why we have to negotiate and talk and have a relationship with our spouse so we can, can, uh, can develop our kids together. Dreams, what we want. Um, ben Sass, you need to read. This is going to be my book of the year for Forge. I haven't published that yet. Vanishing American uh, Adulthood. Ben Sass is, uh, is a senator from Nebraska. Pat Leupold taught him when he was in fourth grade. Absolutely amazing. When he became Senator Pat, got to go up and pray for the guy. And um, that's why he's so good, because of Pat Leupold, who's not even here today to receive the, the praise. But we have to teach our kids. We have to give them positive boundaries. Delayed gratification, right? We have to teach them to work. Uh, we got to teach them manners. We got to teach them curfews. We got to pick our battles carefully. Is everything worth fighting over? In a closed system, it's my way or the highway. In an open system, there's talking. There's some negotiation. And the younger they are, you're still in charge. Um, we need to teach them that actions have consequences, that our punishments of them should fit the crime. Don't you think? Uh, and a lot of times we get angry. When you, when you discipline your kid out of anger, you're going to really you're going to do more damage than good. And so a lot of, I've done that. So the room, isolation is a good thing before you inflict any pain that needs to be inflicted. Otherwise, you might inflict too much pain. We've got to teach grace in the home and we've got to live, uh, live that grace in the home. If we, if, if we teach a closed system of law, they'll become Pharisees. If we teach an open system of antinomianism, anything goes, they'll become rebels. Grace gives us the ability to give the balance. Positive, negative boundaries, uh, uh, appropriate boundaries. And that's a, a so important. I, I know a lot of parents want their kids to be followers of Christ, and so they hammer them every day. The dads are always on them. There's never any grace. You want to create a rebel? You do that. A closed system teaches our children um, to fake the behavior until they get away. Often, I think, the determinative sense of how well have we done as parents is what happens when they move out. It's long-term. Uh, it's long-term. Well, lastly, there's so much here. Obviously, we could go on for years and years, and the guilt level is already up high enough for all of us. But thirdly, we pro pro uh, provide protection for our kids when we give an emotional connection. I love this again, Ephesians 6, 4. Uh, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training, the nurture, the instruction of the Lord. There's got to be love, and it's got to come from you too. We expect mamas to be loving, although 
in our day and age, what we are seeing, what I see pastorally, what I see is I see women who've been aping men to work in the workplace, to develop the temperament as a man. And I see a lot of times that the wife, the mother, is not as nurturing as she used to be 50 years ago. But what we need to see is a continued resurgence of warm, manly love for our kids. I will always love you. I will always be there for you. You mess up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. But I'm your father. And I will always be your father. Grace. That's how God views us. By the way, the relationship that we have with God is not a closed system. It's an open system. So that when we screw up, who do we run to? Right back to our Father. Because Jesus has paid for all of our screw-ups and our sins and our breaking of the law. Uh, it, it's just wonderful. The relationship we have with, if you walk around every day and you're afraid that God is going to zap you, you have a closed system view of God and you don't have a biblical view of God. Martin Luther became a monk because he was walking away. He wanted to be, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer. He was going to become a lawyer, but there was a lightning storm and the lightning struck nearby and he said, I'll become a monk. Well, that's a great, that's a, that's, that's a great call to the ministry. <laughs> Guilt works not long. But grace works every day. I, I love this text in Luke 1, 17. I'm going to end with this. In, in, in the beginning of the Gospels, we see that John the Baptist comes onto the scene. And this is what it says about John the Baptist in Luke 1, 17. And it is he, John the Baptist, who will go as a forerunner before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Look, listen, listen to what John the Baptist's primary role is going to be. You ready? You ready? Here it is. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people for the Lord. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to their kids. Why? Because what sin so often does is it leads us away from our true identity as sons. And to try to find our identity in our work or our success or in other ways. So that we forget where our hearts ought to be applied. And our heart is in our work. Our heart is in all those things that are good. But ultimately, well, let me put it this way. No amount of success at work can ever compensate for failure at home. That, that our manhood is deeply affected as we grow in grace ourselves in an open system with the Father. And by learning from Him, learning to present an open system to our family, to our network. Now, don't you dare walk out of here if you've ever made a mistake as a father and heap guilt on yourself. If you have guilt to confess, confess it. We've all made mistakes as fathers. Confess it. If you've got to confess to your kids, confess it. If you've got to confess to your wife that you've made mistakes in, in fathering, confess it. And then receive the grace that is ours in Christ. Hold your head up and be thankful deeply that your Father loves you more than you can ever understand. Receive His forgiveness. And then you go out there and you get involved in the lives of your kids. You invest in the lives of your grandkids. If you can't, invest in the life of some other kids or another younger man. But invest. Don't forget the whole goal of this is the return on investment is the glory of God and building great men. And when men grow, when men flourish, then women, children, churches, and culture, providing protection. A lot to think about, right? Yeah, me too. Let's pray. Our great Father, we love you, and we thank you that you love us. 
We thank you that we can call you Father. And every one of us in talking about such an important subject is humbled right now. But Lord, I pray for my brothers, I pray for myself, that the riches of your glory and the grace of Christ would flood our hearts right now. As we head out into the world, may, may you bind the hands of the evil one who would, who would leave us under a weight of guilt and give us now, Lord God, the greatness of your grace to give what we have been given to others. Your great love, your unconditional love, forgiveness, use us. Make us dads that make a difference by providing protection. For we pray these things in your strong and holy name, Lord Jesus. God's men said, amen. amen. Have a great rest of the week, guys. Go for it. <laughs>